Greetings from the International Council for Small Business. This is Ayman Tarabishi, Deputy Chair of the Department of Management at the George Washington University School of Business and ICSB Executive Director. This is the ICSB Exchange webinar. I am just delighted to have Dean Bigo with us here this morning. And so let me actually start the slides to make them larger. They're fantastic here. Dean Bigo, greetings from the Washington DC. How is France, how is Paris, and how are you? We're, we're just fine, we're just fine. I hope you're fine too. And thank you very much, dear um, Ayman. Um, and thank you very much to ACSB for this uh, great opportunity that you're offering us. Uh, it seems that half of the world is confined now as a uh, lockdown, more or less, a stay at home, as you say. Uh, we say confiné, but uh, it's more or less a situation from one person uh, on the planet out of two. Absolutely. Um, what I want to do is actually just introduce you a little bit before we get into the questions here. And I'm going to read this because it's nice to read here. Um, let me just move this here. Uh, Dean Bigo is the CEO of the IPAC Business School, Paris-Nice Group, since July 2008, and graduated from the Institut d'Etoile Politique de Paris. He was also the deputy editor-in-chief of the Événement du Judy and a journalist at Maria. He is a writer and author, notably of September Scenarios, The Apocalypse, published in 2002, Les Studios du Monde, which you gave me a very nice copy with, with, uh, with uh, Fayad. Right? Um, you've been around a while with IPAG, and, 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 and it seems that I have taken some liberty in, when I was doing social media, calling you the rebel dean. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yes, so I, have, I apologize if you didn't like it, but I called you the rebel dean, so the whole world will recognize you as a rebel <laughs> dean here. So maybe tell us a little bit about yourself. As long as it has no uh, historical connotation and link to the history of the United States, because I probably, if I was American, I would probably not um, sided by the rebels, uh, but uh, that's another story. Um, but thanks, why not, after all, why not? Um, I think... Uh, Churchill once put it that if you have some enemy in your life, it means that uh, once, once you stood for your positions and for your convictions, that's the reason why some people don't like you. So I, I, I accept it and thank you very much. Uh, but I just try to, to do my job as, as best as possible. And uh, we have a great institution. Uh, IPAG is a, is a very small by size business school, uh, especially compared to uh, uh, very huge institutions linked to uh, universities uh, uh, among, uh, within the, in the world. As you know, in France, uh, business schools are separated from the, from the universities. And even in France, where business schools are quite small, like quite good, I should say, but quite small also, we are one of the smallest by size. Uh, but I think, in my view, uh, trying to be objective, uh, we are not small by our let's say, both academic and, and reputation and also our origins. If I may, um, if I may add this uh, historical point, actually it is the uh, economic advisor of Charles de Gaulle in uh, 1962, uh, Mr. Jacques Rueff, which was a former, uh, which was a well-known economist uh, this time, Jacques Rueff, uh, economic advisor of General de Gaulle, he founded IPAG. So we had a great foundation, and also we are one of the, uh, of the few uh, French business schools ranked in Shanghai. Uh, it depends on the years, but for instance, on economic uh, scientific fields, we are ranked first, second, and third. And what is great for us is we are more or less have one out of 10, uh, one tenth of the budget and of the, of the uh, uh, the human resources of our uh, competitors in France. So we're quite happy to be small. Small is beautiful, as you say, in the US. And actually, you're absolutely right. Currently, with the crisis that's happening here, people that have been intentionally small and focused and, and compact in their strategy and their plans are faring better than large institutions where they need to mobilize very fast and to get things done. But let me talk a little bit about the school itself. And you joined from 2008 up to now. You've probably seen many transformations of IPAC. If you can talk a little bit about the transformations 
while you are there and under your leadership, that will help us set the stage for more conversations a little bit later. Sure. Um, actually, <clears throat> I, when I arrived, I noticed that we had um, incredible um, geographical locations to start with, because we're not only in one of the most beautiful city in the world, Paris, but we are right in the center of Paris. Uh, I know it's the case also of the great institutions you work uh, for uh, in, in DC, but um, it's quite unusual for business schools to be right in the center, like in the historical center of Paris. It also the case in Nice uh, by the French Riviera, which is an incredible location, so worldwide known. And, um, and also, in, when I arrived, I noticed that we had no English speaking um, uh, classes, courses, uh, almost none. Um, and um, it seems to me that uh, the, uh, the opportunity was to attract foreign students from all over the world uh, with, let's say, very uh, qualitative uh, business classes, economic classes, and so on. And also to be able to uh, uh, benefit from those incredible locations. And we applied the same, um, the same strategy with the, with the with the teachers, with the researchers, that's the reason why we developed three main um, conferences, scientific academic conferences. Uh, we have three per years, one in finance, uh, one very specialized in the economy of energy, uh, and especially the decarbon energy uh, uh, system of, of, of a new economic uh, system, um, energy and environment, that's the, that's the topic. And the third is a large, largest, let's say, um, broad, broadest, largest uh, business um, scientific conferences. And uh, we said, uh, it, it seems to us that we had to use those locations and we had to uh, play the quality, but play the quality worldwide, saying that we're not very well known in France, we're quite small in France, uh, but it's not going to stop us to be, to be recognized uh, worldwide which was a quite successful strategy because now we're uh, not only working with you, we're working with the University of Chicago, we're working from, with, some, with Harvard, we're working with uh, uh, Singapore, we're working uh, um, with many institutions uh, in the world. And they don't really care that if, if we're small or if we're big, um, that uh, as uh, Deng Xiaoping put it, we don't care if the cats are uh, white or the cats are black. The only issue, is, especially in business, if the cats, the, the cat, the, they're able to catch mice. That's the only thing we're interested about. It's also the same in, uh, in the scientific field. So, um, and the second idea that we had, very simple, is to say that on the long term, um, what makes the quality of an institution like us is the quality, it's a notion of quality, it's not a notion of quantity. Uh, it's quality versus quality, quantity. and uh, we've seen that all of our uh, competitors in France, they wanted to grow big, 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 and, and bigger and bigger. And they wanted to um, reproduce, let's say, standards that are internationally well known. And they spend a lot of energy uh, doing that. And they're not focused on their quality and the quality of the, specifically on the scientific field and scientific production. Um, and we thought that maybe it's going to be something uh, uh, quite hard, but if we were able to do the most difficult thing, um, then we were uh, necessarily able to cope um, with the standards. If we're going to be above the standards and we reach, um, let's say, um, objectives uh, that are above the standards, then we'll be able to get back and, and follow the standards more easily. And it seems that it was uh, quite um, it, it, it went, it well, it went very sorry, um, it went quite well. We started with, let's say, um, 8 million euros um, budget, and we are uh, over 30 million euros budget. We've created, I think, um, more, we hired more than uh, 185 people, and we started with a very small team of uh, less than 50 people. Um, and also what we did is to attract students, more and more students. We are uh, able to open something, uh, able to open a, um, a small campus in Kunming by the, almost the border between China and Vietnam. It's also a very, um, let's say, a strategy of original strategy. Uh, most of the business school, they wanted to open in Beijing in China or in Shanghai. 
where it's very internationalized and where everybody is. And we're not, uh, we didn't want to do what the other um, universities or institutions did. Uh, number one, because we're not big enough to do that. And some others were already there and were bigger than us. And we ask advice from the uh, uh, Chinese government and especially to the ambassador of, of uh, China in France, which was quite close to, to, the Deng, uh, to um, Jiang Zemin. And uh, he told us, uh, don't go, you're right, don't go to Shanghai, to Beijing, you'll be nobody there. Go uh, to Kunming. Kunming is interesting for two reasons. Uh, number one, it's very dynamic on economic fields. Uh, for us, China, we are more or less an empire more than a nation. So for an empire like us, um, the minorities in the north and the minorities in the south of the country are key, um, are, are extremely strategic. We, are, we want to pay a very, very big attention to them. Otherwise, China can explode. So we invest a lot in those regions, and it was true. And also, you will have no other competitors, no other foreigners, and you become uh, the, 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 the face of the Western world for the whole region. And that's the reason why we're able to talk face to face with the top, uh, uh, let's say, leaders in the region of Yunnan, because we're almost the one of our kind in, in Yunnan in, in this region. Uh, and it's, extreme, it's an extremely dynamic region and very uh, interesting, fascinating region. Also, a little part of history, during the, the, big, um, the big march, Mao Zedong, and during the, the war between, uh, with the Japanese, the Second World War, all the universities uh, from Beijing and from Shanghai, they went back, they, um, they flew back to the south. And also, um, this region of uh, Kunming and Yunnan is, is high, is, it has a very high quality level of university. So it's an example of what we're doing. We tend to do what the others are not doing, uh, just not because we're rebels, as you put it, uh, because I think um, it's, we, we should find our, our own path. Uh, you, it's not very interesting to copy the others because uh, usually the others are doing better. Which is, which is absolutely correct because if, if copying does not make you a leader, copying makes you a follower. And so you have to take the first step forward. As an entrepreneurial leader, and what I really like, what I'm really impressed about here is how you can bring history, relevance, and strategy all together in, in one conversation. Here. I want to go to the next slide. And I want you to kindly talk a little bit about France, but in particular Paris, what you have seen evolve, and, and maybe a little bit talk about now, the current situation that's happening now, which will lead us to a little bit more later on discussion of how the future is going to evolve here. So maybe a historical little bit background and how your school and you see it and how this all ties to this whole situation that we're living in right now. Wow, what a question. Um, it seems to us that um, the, um, this big change that we've seen after the collapse of USSR uh, and um, let's say the Reagan Thatcher era, uh, which is also uh, the big era for the global market idea. And it's also the same uh, paradigm, if I put it that way, that the uh, Anglo-Saxon way of doing business. Um, so this should be um, the standard for the rest of the world. And for us, we have no, strictly no problem with using English and, uh, and because the English is a, like a lingua franca, is a, is a, uh, a very practical tool, uh, linguistic tool uh, for internationalization. So it seems to us that not everything is bad uh, with this uh, global globalization uh, business, the Anglo-Saxon way. Some things are very good. Um, the tools, starting with the business tools that, uh, the U.S. has invented because uh, business, uh, business science, business has been uh, formalized in the United States uh, in the early 20s and 30s, and it was exported in the rest of the world. So these tools are quite um, useful, and we're not going to say the opposite because we're a business school. Uh, English language is fine, and many other things are interesting, but there is a big but. Uh, but it is very, very convenient for the Anglo-Saxons because it's the way they view the world. Um, it's the way they can uh, maximize, if I can uh, also use that expression, maximize their 
um, their assets and their, um, their specific uh, qualities as a nation, as a culture. And if we, uh, if we don't pay attention to the way we uh, adapt ourselves to these uh, standards, if we don't do the efforts to make the difference between what is compatible with what we are as French people, uh, what is compatible with our culture, with our way of doing things, and what is not. And, and we, if we don't ask ourselves the question, what as a nation or as a school do we have specifically to bring to the rest of the world, there we're just going to be uh, in the, completely wrong. Because uh, again, if we want to become an Anglo-Saxon, uh, if you want to become American, you're never going to be as good as an American to pretend you're an American. It's just stupid. And the American way to do business is quite interesting. But if as French people or as European people, the only thing we have to bring to the world is trying to be American and to be American in our way of doing business, we're not going to bring anything. We're going to be under American. And uh, it seems to me very, very uh, striking that most of the business schools in France, they wanted to do the, everything the American way, everything the Anglo-Saxon way, everything with the US standards and so on. And again, I'm not criticizing those standards. Those standards are interesting. Things are very interesting sometimes, but we really have to pay attention to how, how do we um, adapt themselves to us and how we have to uh, adapt ourselves also to those, those tools naturally. And in, at the end of the day, the question is what do we have to bring um, specifically? So this is a very general, very theoretical, uh, way to um, to um, broad the landscape. Now, if we becoming more uh, precise, uh, <clears throat> it seems to us that um, the way um, French people as to do business, for instance, in France, uh, we have a very long history of uh, coping with very different and very exotic cultures. Uh, for instance, Egypt. Uh, I know that it's a country that you like. Uh, Egyptology as a science was founded by Napoleon. So the French people, when they arrived in, in Egypt, they wanted to study everything about Egypt. They wanted to study language. They wanted to study the way people think. They wanted to study, of course, the, uh, the cultural uh, heritage, the architectural heritage, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So in, in the French culture, for instance, we have this big, um, people say French are arrogant. It's both true and, and false. It's true, naturally, um, as many great nations, I think we have a very high idea of, of our missions and of, of, of ourselves. But at the same time, we're not arrogant in the, in the sense that we are extremely curious and we're extremely keen to understand the others in a very specific way. We don't want to do the multicultural thing. We don't want to do, okay, let's say, and let's learn to the students that others are different. No, we don't care. Others are not others. Others are Africans that are from Ivory Coast, for instance. They're from Mali. People from Mali and people from Ivory Coast, they don't think the same way. People from Senegal and people from Ivory Coast, they have a different world in their mind. It's not because they are West African. It's not because they are uh, English, French speaking nations. It's true for Senegal. It's true from, from uh, Ivory Coast. But the way the picture of the world is completely different. It's completely different ethnic um, uh, tribes. It's different religion. It's a different history. It's completely different. So we don't want to learn the students uh, to be multicultural. No, we want to learn the students. If you deal with China, please learn Chinese. If you deal with Russia, please learn Russians and learn the way Russian think because the way Russian think is not the way uh, the British think the, the French thing, the, the American thing, and so on and so forth. Each nation, they're not better, they're not worse, they're just different. And you have really to pay attention to this difference. And so learning, learning geography, learning the, um, the whole society is a key to success in business. You can learn marketing as much as you want. Marketing will be completely different within 20 years. What Russia is, it's going to be there in 20 years. The Russians, they won't change completely. So being, paying attention to the history of Russia, it seems to be, it seems that is, it's a cultural, historical, uh, and let's say uh, entertaining um, uh, class that you can take in a business school. 
but let's be serious, right? If you want to be serious in a business school, you learn finance, you learn marketing and so on. So you learn tools. Those tools are quite interesting, but believe me, the general background, the culture, the history, the geography, the way the world is shaped, uh, demography, for instance, is a key to success in business. So I'm, I'm going to open up now some for, for some difficult questions here and, and, and be ready here because this is why I was very excited about this session here. Is, um, let me ask this question here, right? What's the day after going to be like? You mentioned the day after. I think that's a great way of to putting it. I had a colleague say it's BC, which is before Corona, and then AC, which is after Corona. But you say the day after. I agree with you. The day after is going to be totally different here. How do you see it? First of all, if we don't pay, uh, if we don't be careful, if we don't pay attention, uh, not only the day after it could look like the day before, but it could have been even worse. I'm um, explaining myself. People all around the world, they're quite excited about, um, let's say, uh, national production, even reg regional, local production, short circuits, uh, protection of the, of the environment. We're seeing extremely horrible things with this virus, but also we're seeing a very clear air, blue sky, all over the planet. So people say, well, it's going to be great because we're going to take, uh, we're going to learn about those lessons and maybe we don't want our economy to rely completely on China. Number one, because uh, as we've seen, there are some types of products that are, that are missing because they're only produced in China. It's specifically true in Europe, but it's probably true also in the US. And we are high, a too high dependence on China as the um, the 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 the, um, the l'usine, the the factory of the world, uh, but also by doing this, we are um, we are making a lot of get, putting a lot of trouble of social trouble, and we are the wages, especially the, the middle class wages, are going down, or they are not uh, increasing with the uh, with the wealth that we are creating, and so. We are going to take uh, lessons from that and it's going to change. Yes, it can change, it should change. I do agree with you, but it won't be, it won't, it's not gonna be a change by itself. It's not gonna be a, let's say a, uh, a magical change. And if we don't do nothing, I think the very famous GAFA, for instance, the Google, uh, I don't know if you put it in English that way, we, we talk about GAFA, referring to Google, uh, Amazon, uh, Apple and Microsoft and all these big um, U.S. companies, but also <clears throat> uh, more uh, the big, uh, let's say, global business uh, will be more resilient and more capable to survive to the huge crisis that is coming, uh, that is, you know, the, the doomsday, the economic doomsday that is coming. So if we don't, if the nation states uh, are not, um, they don't, if they don't pay attention, if they don't su support and help the small business, the business that are capable to reinvent the economy of the day after, then the day after will be we will probably worse. So that's that's the first thing. Second thing, I think now that we've seen everywhere in the world, you know, in all our institution institutions, sorry, is the um, the interest of uh, of using um, the uh, the digital tools. Uh, it's it's changed completely the relationship we have as individuals as professionals as institutions the relationship we have to the to the space and the relationship we have to the time to the space because right before uh, AC uh, BC before corona as you put it uh, it seemed that for us the playground was the, was the world right and now we are confined the, the, the playground is our apartment so it's not exactly the same the same size of a playground uh, and also, it's, it's extremely frustrating to be, to be uh, restricted to in our, in our way to use space. But at the same time, we're thinking about, well, is it completely useful to spend half of our life, sometimes more, to move from one place to another? Is it extremely interesting? Not necessarily. And there's probably something like a good balance that we, everybody can, can see. Today, it's, it's not enough space but maybe the global world is too much space. 
Uh, it's the same with time. Uh, now we have sometimes it depends from one institution to another, especially the use of digital tools. But usually before uh, Corona, uh, the BC st status, we had no more time. Everybody was extremely oppressed by the, uh, the, the agenda. Everybody has too much things to do. Things are to be delivered as app uh, as soon as possible and so on and so forth. So is it a way to be very productive? Certainly not. And now with this uh, coronavirus, we're trying to, to think about what is important, what is not important. We have to um, classify and we have to put a little order and we have to, um, to take time to think. And taking, losing time to think is never a lost time. Uh, in my views, the Roman Empire, they were taking less decisions than our leaders. The Roman, the Roman let's say, uh, emperor, the emperor of Rome, Marc Aurel, if you, Marcus Aurelius, if you read uh, what he wrote, he wrote a book about the way he managed his own business. His business was the biggest empire in the whole history, the Roman Empire. And the way he view his job is to maybe take one or two big decisions per day, not more. Not more, because if you, those are very big decisions, they have to be carefully taught. You have to uh, prepare them carefully and to, uh, uh, and to take a long time before you take the decisions. But let me tell you that those decisions were applied. They were completely applied. If you're Mr. Trump, for instance, or a big uh, leader in a big business, you maybe take maybe 200, 300 decisions per day. Right. How many of those decisions are really applied on the field? How many were important? How many lasted for a long time? So it's the same, um, the way, the same thing, the, the same, um, sorry, I'm, lo I'm losing my English. The same uh, uh, kind of uh, pattern of thinking that I developed for space. Now we don't have enough space, but maybe the world was too much space. Uh, same thing with time. Maybe we have too, more, too much time today and not enough things to do. But we certainly don't want uh, to go back to situations where we don't have the time to think, that we have to act so quickly that nothing really had any kind of meaning. And we're uh, completely, um, um, let's say, oppressed by a, um, a time that we're running after. We have to be, as human beings, we have to master. We have to master the time. We have to master the space. We have to master our life. We have to be in charge. We have to decide as individuals, as nations. We don't want so-called a social or so-called global market to decide for us. We don't want uh, the digital tools to decide for us. We don't want, um, you know, and um, specifically because this virus has decided a lot of things for us. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny little, um, uh, let's say, um, how should I put it, virus. Uh, which is a, a, uh, a form of living, even if it's extremely small. And, and look at the, the impact, the huge impact, the historical impact, and the global impact of this small little thing. It should put us uh, to think about what, uh, how to uh, view a strategy, how to decide things, and maybe s less procedures, less kind, less, um, um, I'm not saying that we don't have to um, think about the future and prepare the future, but as in a war, uh, the first hour of the battle, most of the time, your plan, your strategic plan is completely over. So when something like the virus comes, when the unexpected comes in your life, in the world, and so on, and it should, re it should remind you, refresh you your mind, the unexpected, something unbelievable will always come to you, always. Uh, September 11 was unbelievable, it happened. Uh, the, the collapse of the, of the Berlin Wall was unbelievable, it happens. Uh, this coronavirus was unbelievable, it happens. So now we should be more humble in a way. And if we want to master things, the key is to say we have to be ready for anything. And let's be more and more open and let's more critical thinking than ever. Uh, and let's stop thinking that the future will look like the past or it will look like the present we know. 
The future is always something unbelievable, unexpected. It can be better, it can be worse, but it's most to think it has nothing to do with what you expected. And it's a very, very big lesson. And again, it's a lesson of humility, and it's also a lesson that, uh, uh, of taking things in charge. Because if I want to come back to the business school, if you think about it for a minute, what is marketing? What is finance? What is management? What is communications? Those are procedures. Those are the best ways, the best ways to do things. So if you want to do marketing, if you want to sell something, what are you doing? You're doing about all the data that you're collected thanks to IEI now, you're doing it more better and better and, and quicker and quicker. And you're saying, okay, well, I, here are the sales, here are my figures, here are my data, and I will adapt my strategy to what happened. Wait a minute, is this something that makes sense? Do you think that the future will look like uh, the past? Same thing happened with finance. All this big math that we have in finance, the, it, 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 it impresses uh, the public that doesn't know anything about it usually. And they say, well, it's a big, it's full of math. It's extremely complicated, extremely sophisticated. Those people are, must be very intelligent. Well, look at it. Even if the math is being, sometimes it's extremely sophisticated, what is behind finance is very simple. It's always calculus about the past. Well, finance uh, as a science taught in business school will never tell you anything about it, the, the future, than nothing else but based on the past. So nobody, no banks, no financial analysis could tell us that uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the gas will, uh, will have a value over, uh, over zero dollar. It was unbelievable, it happened. So the past, will never tell you the key and give you the key to the future. Never, ever. It's not, I'm not saying that finance and marketing is not, is not useful or helpful of tools, but they are tools. They're not the truth. Same with management. Uh, you can naturally learn lessons from management and things like that, but you have to be ready for the unexpected. Communication, same thing. Sometimes if you try to apply recipes uh, if you're not able to adapt yourself to things that are, are unaccepted, unexpected, sorry, and you want to be, be like an airplane, uh, like a 747, and you want to, uh, you know, have a, 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 um, a flying uh, map, and you have to develop, you only stick to the procedure, and you want to fly over, uh, over the, uh, the flying map, it can be a catastrophe. If you're not capable to change the route map, it's a catastrophe. If a storm happens, you don't have to follow the procedure. There, sometimes there is no procedure for certain, certain things that happens. So I think the way we should change uh, business schools, it learns that to the students. Uh, be open, try to focus on knowledge that will last, not only on tools that will be updated um, maybe in the next uh, in the next five years or ten years, things are, are growing very very fast. Last lesson I think is the relationship for the day after between individual and the group, and what should we, we should put as a general interest. Probably historically, we'll see what happens in China, but everybody has noticed already, as at least we have noticed in Europe and France, that the nations in Asia because they have, they have a strong, strong, strong feeling of, um, let's say, collective commitment. They have a strong sense of general interest. They think the individuals are, have to follow the rules, the collective rules, and they think that the individual is less important than the, than the, than the society. Uh, they, they, they manage to adapt themselves much better to this crisis than our, let's say, individualistic uh, societies. In my view, we should not follow completely uh, blindly the uh, Asian model, because we're not Asian again. So we, even, even if we try to be Asian, if we try to be Chinese, we're not going to be successful doing that, and they'll be better than us. But there's something interesting in this uh, model. The thing that is interesting is we should, I think we should look for balance between individual interest and general interest, general uh, interest. 
Um, this is what we're doing in, 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 um, at EPAG for the research, for instance. Um, this is what um, um, Adnan Malawi in the incubator is doing. He's working with uh, inmates, for instance. Uh, it's a general um, interest issue. He's not doing it, he's not doing it uh, only because it's a, it's a, it's a, as a virtue, it has a social virtue, it is something good. Uh, he's doing it because I think you learn more um, and if you have a, 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 it's always, if I, sh I should put it that way, it's always nicer to give a gift and to receive a gift. It's something that we've all experienced. It's something about uh, this global system, uh, Thatcher, Reagan, uh, market, purely market Anglo-Saxon way, that is right, of course. Uh, you can be very efficient if uh, you're looking for the, uh, for, the, for the individual success. But at the same time, it should be balanced because there's something that, it, that drives you more that your own interest uh, is the general interest, is what makes really a lot of sense. So in the way we teach students, we should definitely look for a, uh, um, to, to, to pay a big, big attention uh, to uh, how we train them, for instance, in groups, uh, how we give them grades, for instance. Um, there's an individual value, but there's also a collective value. And there's no such thing as an individual value without a collective value. I think it should be one of the big lessons of this uh, uh, coronavirus. You, you raise a lot of good points, and I was taking some notes down here. You talked about doing versus being. Doing is everybody's been before been doing a lot of things. We've always been busy. We're always running around Absolutely. so fast, and everything is, is past due. And now you're saying, well, that's going to change now. This doing business is going to change to being. Who are we as beings? So you raised that point. And the second thing you talked about, which is also very well articulated by Talib, that he talks about the black swan, that once in a generation, a black swan happens, it changes the world. Let's combine both concepts here. And I want to ask you this question. Moving forward, as, uh, as the dean of the school, you have a black swan that's center stage in your school now, which is the, the, which is the corona. And now the students are realizing that they're caught between doing versus being, right? How do you move your school, and not just your school, because other schools are paying attention, other schools are having these conversations, but your school is more nimble, it's faster, just because of its size, its location, its way of thinking, its, its DNA. How do you see that night when you're sitting there trying to articulate a strategy for the school to move forward? How do you combine the black swan concept with being and the curriculum, the hiring of the faculty, the student recruitment, your, your plans to go abroad or stay more local in. How do you combine all of this? Because as you said, it takes one or two decisions and I'm half Italian and I'm a big fan of Roman history, right? <laughs> but your decisions that you make will impact IPAC for the next decade, which is the next generation, which is what I call the Corona generation. In briefly, before I open it up to questions, and more difficult questions are coming, I promise you. <laughs> okay. Um, it seems that um, luckily, or maybe wisely, I don't know, um, if we take, for instance, the, uh, the scientific uh, um, subjects that we've picked up, uh, which can, our energy and economy, how, how do we get rid of, uh, of oil? Um, if the, uh, the other big subject is um, ethic finance, we have a, a, um, uh, an int uh, a fund, an interest fund named um, 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 Quantix, which is a, a, a fund um, that is a real fund. It's, it's investing money actually from people from the outside. They give us money and we teach and train the students how to invest and make uh, money um, uh, and, and manage the fund. Uh, and they learn how to do finance by doing this. Um, but only if the, uh, in the, if the investment is ethic. We have also a big uh, chair in uh, Made in France. We are thinking about how to get back uh, some of our industry 
because we think that uh, people will be very, very careful to the origin of the products uh, more than um, and, and more paying more attention to the quality than to quantity. And probably they will less consume tomorrow, but they want to consume things that are certain meanings, certain origins, uh, and they want to trace this origin. So um, we're thinking about getting back some of our industry. So this is made in France thing. I'm talking about what Adnan is doing with his incubator and so on. So luckily enough, our main subjects are quite well um, in the um, in the uh, in the targets of the uh, of the post corona uh, post corona um, let's say reinvention of the of the uh, the economy of the business. Now, what are the big decisions to to take to adapt ourselves to that to to the to the world of tomorrow, that's a question you're asking. Um, I would say um, trying to put the, the students in the situations, be nimble enough to think that um, uh, there are something like the, um, let's say, we can, as a business school, we can definitely teach knowledge. Uh, we can, um, teach knowledge and uh, evaluate the students and uh, make them uh, intellectually work. But we have no, no big tools to modify their behavior. And as, as we know, the behavior is key to success. So how do we do this? That's a big question. How do we uh, make sure then that the, uh, uh, I'm looking for a word that I have in French in my mind, um, le savoir être, the, the way they, they be, and not only what they know, but the way they behave, right? How do we change that? I think we have to think in terms of hub. Uh, business schools of tomorrow, that's why big beliefs, will be hubs. Uh, they will be hubs with the military, they will be hubs with the, uh, uh, maybe the, the hospitals, they will be hubs with the, um, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, environment uh, associations and so on. And we'll have to offer the students experience, uh, experience of life. Well, they will be challenged. Well, they will put, uh, will put them um, uh, in situations more or less extreme. We're already doing it. Uh, well, they will learn, learn about themselves, learn about their own limits. They will learn about uh, the way they interact with the others um, because there's no such thing as experience. And, a way to learn certain things about behavior, which is again, a key to success, even in the business world, especially probably in the business world, we, we don't, it's not useful to learn concepts. It's very useful to be put in situations where to, you have to learn by yourself. Uh, so I think it's a very, very big uh, issue. Tomorrow business will, uh, will want to hire people tomorrow not only people they will trust to be able to trust them, but people will be able to uh, not only serve their own interest, this, uh, you know, this uh, Wall Street type of guy uh, that is a shark capable to eat all the competitors and being the biggest, uh, you know, the biggest shark in the, in the, um, in the, in the sea. I don't think that it has a big future, honestly. I'm not saying I'm not naive at all competitions will, will stay, it's among uh, human nature, uh, will be rivals, will be competitors and so on. By the competitor, the competition will be more a collective competition than individual competitions. Uh, and the collective values will grow bigger and bigger. That's the reason why I think we should train our students by learning them the value of, of general interest. And it's not a theory, it's a practice. If you are, uh, we're already doing this at APAG. We're putting, uh, let's say, uh, teams of 10 up to 20 students, and we set them in the Alps during the winter uh, for seven days and six nights, and they have to sleep in the snow by themselves during the winter in the Alps. And believe me, it's extremely, it's an extreme experience. Uh, it's an extreme experience. It's very well, um, let's say, um, organized by, by professionals of this type of things. 
Uh, and it's not a gadget. It's not something to say, well, you know what? I did something very, very difficult in my life. I can tell you, and it's not an interview thing. It's not a, a dinner in town thing. It's a thing where they know that if they want to survive, they really have to rely on one on another. Uh, and so it's, it's something very humble because we're doing this because we know that during, by, by teaching students in the class, you cannot teach that. You can only teach it uh, when you know that you, you're in the middle of nowhere, uh, it's below uh, 20 um, degrees below zero Celsius, uh, it's the winter and you really have to be able to, uh, to count on your, on your pal because if you fall asleep then you probably never uh, wake up in the morning. So that's an example. We're doing it in, in different, with the different experience like that. But I think um, it has, it's not necessary, it has to be extreme. Uh, it has to be collective. It has to have meaning. Uh, and it has to turn, teach the students that there's an opposition between consuming and producing. Has, so, as a consumer, yeah. the business, they want you to uh, follow your instinct. They want you to follow, they, want, they don't want you to resist your frustration. Uh, as a big consumer, you say you want something, you buy it. And it's not the way, uh, it's not the way the people uh, want you as a producer. As a producer, precisely, you have to take into account the others. You have to take into account your colleagues. You have to take into account the stakeholders. You have to take into account the strategy of the, of the firm and so on. So if we don't, we don't, I think the, the big, big, big mistake is to uh, keep going as nothing happened and we'll still want to uh, uh, produce sh like Wall Street sharks capable to eat the others looking for their own interest and their own uh, individual interest and being able to work like this. I don't think it has, an, an, it has a future. So I have a question here. We're going to open up the question here. A question came here. He goes, hello, Dean Bigot. Having served as dean of school that attracts 2,500 students a year, how do you see the future of the business schools? What lessons can the schools of business, and this is where I know you talked about it before, but this is what's unique about it. The business schools in Africa learn from this French model, knowing very well we're talking African journal, but Africa is one of the fastest growing continents in the world. It is the fastest growing middle class in the world, and it has the largest youth population in the world. And the ILO, the International Labor Organization, with the decent jobs for youth, has a huge focus on this over there. How would, how, how, if we take you and move you to Africa, what would you tell them saying, here's what we're planning to do, here's what you should be focusing on? It's a great question. Thank you very much because uh, not only we, we have opened in a school, uh, we have opened an IPAG school in Ivory Coast, uh, in Abidjan, uh, for uh, five years now. Uh, we're we're um, having uh, uh, both um, um, executive education uh, and we also have a bachelor, three years bachelor. Um, so we share completely this conviction that uh, Africa will be a, it would be the key uh, in, in it, it can be it can be the uh, uh, it can be the a, a, an incredible le uh, leverage of growth of, of, uh, of, of for, for business and for the economy in the, in the world uh, or it can also be a very big problem especially for, for Europe because of the uh, if, if things are, are going well there, it's gonna be a great, great wealth, especially for France. If things are going bad there, it's gonna be really big, big, big political and social issues and problems uh, in France. So in my view, <clears throat> um, what, what we are telling the students in Vietnam, for instance, so the students in, in Ivory Coast, in Africa, um, we're telling them, look, uh, we have to stop now thinking that we are your future and the only thing you want is to copy us. No, you have to find your own path. Do and deal with the African culture because it's a different culture. And it's not saying that because it's different, it's better. No, not at all. There's big, big problems in Africa that we have to address. For instance, corruption is a big problem. 
uh, tribal rivalry is a big problem, so on and so forth. But we can really apply our solutions to you because you, your uh, issues are quite specific and you have to find within your own culture, the, uh, within your own, let's say, historical DNA, uh, the, the answers. But I'm telling them sincerely, it's, don't think that it's an it's a opportunity for you guys to have a relationship with a business school in France. It is also an extraordinary opportunity, extraordinary, uh, it's extraordinarily lucky for us to have a connection with you in Africa. Because again, uh, we are not going to be your future, but you are we are definitely be part of your future if you have a future, and you guys are going to be part of our own future as French producer, as French consumers, and so on and so forth. So I think that we are thinking too small. What we have in Europe is already good. It's called Erasmus. It's a way to exchange students within the European Union, fine. But what about going to a country that is re relatively close to you in terms of, uh, of um, different life standards and educational standards and people thinking, speak the same kind of English, they have the same experiment, the, sorry, the same experience as students, the same way to view the world, the Western world, it's not that rich. What uh, I want to do it at EPAG, and I would advise that to many schools in the world, is to send students, not as humanitarian uh, workers, not as a, let's say, um, to discover something, an exotic uh, experience, no. Go to Africa to study, do exchange with African schools, African universities, even if it's complicated, even if the, the standards, uh, let's say the medical standards, the food standards, the, uh, you know, the, the CLIM um, and things like that are not easy or not uh, uh, what, the, what the, the, the standard expected by the students. It's part of the, it's part of the, uh, of the experience. It's part of the, of the trip in a way it's included and it's going to be very interesting, but also um, you have to see um, we have to, we definitely have to send our students there and not only uh, have students from those nations. Uh, the nations of Africa, they want to send their students abroad, which is a good thing, but we definitely, us as Americans, as Europeans, we have to send students to these schools and to see the way they are doing things and what the, um, let's say, what the opportunities, but also what are the, uh, the limits uh, of doing business there, it, it's because if you don't confront yourself to the limits, you, you'll never find a way to overcome them or to uh, overpass them. So uh, in my view, yes, Africa is definitely, definitely, especially for France, a very big issue. It's gonna be, for instance, think about it. Um, European Union is something that is quite complicated, especially for a country like France. It's also quite complicated with Italy, for, for Spain because Euro is a, is a very high currency, very well um, shaped for, a, for an economy like Germany or for the Netherlands, because Netherlands and Germany is a high productivity economy. And um, Euro is a very high uh, currency. And, uh, but if Germany has a, a currency on its own, then uh, Deutschmark, German currency will be much higher than Euro. That is to say the weak economies uh, French, uh, Italian, um, um, Spanish economies and economies from the south of Europe are more or less dumping or sponsoring uh, the German exports or the Netherlands exports. So it's, it's quite complicated for us in terms of employment, in terms of productivity, because we cannot play on the value of the currency. We cannot devaluate our currency and the currency is quite high and it's quite complicated economically for the French government to say, well, you are not productive enough, which is true. So let's put down the, the wages 20, 30% down. It won't work that way. It's gonna be an explosion, it's gonna be a revolution. So as we don't master our currency value, uh, we have a very big social problems. As if we turn ourselves to Africa, for instance, we dip, so we have to think of out of the box. Uh, maybe European Union is not the, it's not gonna be the, you know, the future for France forever. Uh, we have to be very uh, uh, adaptive also. Africa is 700 million people, 700 million people 
speaking French tomorrow, within 20 years. Uh, they will need everything. They will need electricity. They will need security. They will need uh, transports. They will definitely need uh, all sorts of goods. And we don't want to reproduce the, the mistakes of the past. These people are not stupid. Africans are not stupid. If we go there and try to steal them or to act like, unfortunately, the Chinese are acting in Africa most, most of the time, that is taking advantage of them, they will kick you out sooner or later. So again, we don't have to be naive, but if we need to do business, and it's a big lesson for business schools, how to do business, it has to be a long-term business. It, it, you have to look for your advantage, but the, peop the, per the people you're doing business with you have to have advantage too. So I, I think it's a, it's, it's a very critical issue, a very strategic issue. So we, we have a minute left, or maybe two minutes left, just because we started right. a bit late. Cool. But, but we started this, and we went all the way from, from Egyptology to the Romans, to the Europeans, to, to, to Africa, to the Chinese. We went global in a span of 40 minutes, 50 minutes. Um, Egypt plays a critical role. Uh, I got a graph yesterday from Egypt, from a colleague of mine, saying all economies are going in, on a downward spiral Egypt is forecasting a 2.5 increase in, in, in GDP, right? So there's a great opportunity in Egypt. So it seems like it, Egypt might be the right next first step for IPAC to go local, which is local for me is global, but local. That's, exactly. that's, that's the, that's, so you have an invitation. I think our colleagues from Egypt will be delighted to talk to you. And I think last time we tried to have you come to Egypt for them. So there's a conversation here that way, is waiting to happen. And as you said, it's time of being versus doing. I think this is a great time to have a conversation with them. I don't connect you with them. But I want you to, to focus, if you are going to write a letter to the future, right? And this is how you'll end it. You're going to write a letter to the future, and it's a quick text message, WhatsApp message, like I WhatsApp you here. What message will you share? to the future saying about about now i'm gonna make it a little bit more complex here about you dean migo about ipac about france about europe and about the world your message has to cover all of them and i'll stop with difficult questions <laughs> well what a question what a question um again um you will certainly not um, be able to be successful um, if you think that the success is uh, is individual. Uh, as an individual, you can you can success you can succeed if you understand quite well that the success will be brought and recognized not only recognized but brought by the others. That implies that your own success will imply the success of the others. It's again everything but naive. It's completely realistic. If you face things, you know, frankly and broadly, you can steal some, somebody once, twice, but after a while, it will know that you're taking advantage of, of him. So again, uh, doing business can not only be um, looking, I, I don't think that um, um, if, you look, if every individual on in the world is looking for his individual interest, it will bring naturally a form of balance. I don't, I don't believe in that. I believe that as an individual, you naturally have to defend your own interests. You naturally have to pursue them and to make calculus uh, under constraint, but you have to take into account the others. Uh, without the others, you're nothing. That's very simple. Thank you. This, is, this has been an, exceptionally, an exceptional webinar. When I saw it and I, I spoke to you in Washington and I always thought our conversations were electric because of the conversations and how we move fast from one to the other here. Um, I want to apologize for my English. Your English is perfect. I think it's, it's perfect. Absolutely. The messages I've been getting are just <laughs> very well. Um, next steps is I know ICSB was planning to go to um, Paris in July and we're working with Adnan on this. I think things might change and we might move it to a, di to a, di a different date in the, in the future here. But on, on behalf of ICSB, on behalf of everybody around the world, uh, we want to thank you for your time, for your effort, for your dedication as well, and for your thinking. Thinking today is, is, a, is a very rare commodity. 
everybody's reacting and nobody's thinking. Uh, so we, we really appreciate your, your critical thinking about everything and your provocative questions, which are a little critical here. And I wanna, I wanna thank you. And just to tell you something very nice here, very, very, you'll smile tomorrow. And we will have a webinar at um, three o'clock Eastern time, which I think is 8 p.m. French time. We have the first ever ICSB small business cooking class. Great. Uh, a French restaurant, a French um, uh, chef that moved to the United States that opened a, a highly critically acclaimed French restaurant, right? And he's coming on ICSB exchange webinar to talk about small businesses, talk about restaurants, which are critical in France, right? Every, when I go to Paris all the time, every corner has a great restaurant. You can't just stop and not, not eat in every restaurant. Here, he's gonna come online and share with us what they're doing to survive in the times like this, and how he moved from offline to online. He's doing wine tasting with people on, online. He's showing them how to try to cook French cuisine, which is difficult. Right, but he's coming, so we will send you the invitation. We would love to have you join us here. But on that, I want to thank you for coming as well. Well, thank you very much, dear uh, Ayman al uh, It's It's always a great, great, great pleasure. Again, I want to apologize for my English. Uh, and uh, thanks to everybody who was, which, was, uh, which was listening. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. And thanks to my team that are very, very, very more than helpful, starting with Adnan, uh, for this uh, OSCSB uh, event that we're going to have in Paris. I hope it's going to take place um, the way we want it, um, corona or not corona. Uh, let's probably finish with this. This disease is terrible for a certain type of people, uh, but never forget that it's 0 0.5 uh, total of lethality of mortality. And, uh, and mankind have seen many, many worse things in the past, and we always uh, overcome. So thank, thank you very much. Have a sure, good day. You're welcome. Bye. Bye.